Well, hello everyone and welcome to the Ranger Rob Country Living Podcast with Rob Scribner and Dale Wiley. How are you today? I'm doing well, Ranger Rob. How are you? <laughs> Not bad. So last Thursday we didn't do a show because Ranger Rob was in Facebook jail. <laughs> oh. it kind of caused a little bit of problems, so I was in jail for three days. And I didn't do anything. I really didn't. Um, That's I what they all say. With Jill. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I was innocent. I'm telling you. Anyway, uh, I was like, I got to fix the screener. So they freed me up uh, yesterday. So it was like, all right, we'll do a Monday show just for the fun of it. But we'll still do a Thursday show for those who are uh, uh, trying to you know, keep up with our, <laughs> with our, our schedule, whatever that schedule may be here. And, uh, yeah, so. Um, first of all, I want to let you know, you can find, uh, our podcast at Ranger Rob, uh, Ranger Rob Country Living Podcast, which by the way, if you just go to your Alexa and you go out and, and, and my Alexa is going to freak out. So I may have to talk to it, but if you go walk up to your Alexa, show it your pretty eyes and just say, Alexa, play Ranger Rob Country Living Podcast. <laughs> and you know what? Yeah, <laughs> it is. There you go. Alexa, Alexa, stop. <laughs> so that's all you have to do because uh, we're in Amazon uh, and, and what they call Amazon Play. So anyway, yeah, just say those simple words. And uh, uh, and after you've done it once or twice, uh, Alexa gets kind of used to hearing you say it. So, But the first time, make it real clear. Say Ranger Rob Country Living Podcast and make sure it understands. Otherwise, it might bring something from Jamaica. So anyway. Uh, we're also on Spotify, and you'll find us on iHeartRadio, and and um, and our main platform is Spreaker. So there you go. All those links are in the description. And yes, sir, Bob. So uh, we about Dale <laughs> a lot, and uh, one of them is uh, I've got the uh, I, I finally replenished my uh, something and my. My biggest recommendation for prepping. This is the number one thing to have. What do you think it is? A lot this of money. Is the top of the list. <laughs> a lot of Way money. up there. A lot right? of money. A lot of money. Well, money's there. Yeah. I mean, that's important. <laughs> but no, I, I, I've got it. So um, I'll tell you a little story first to go with it is uh, my father in law who passed away and we bought this house. Um, he loved to go to Harbor Freight. <laughs> He really loved it because he had tools like crazy. I, you know, when we were up here visiting and we keep our fifth wheel up here when they were uh, going at it here. And uh, we go to Harbor Freight and he's looking around. He's buying all these little doodads and stuff. And he goes, uh, you know, there's a really good price on electrical tape. I'm going, great. So I go electrical tape. They're 10 packs. And he's like. You can never have enough electrical tape. And I'm kind of like, and this is maybe 10 years ago. I'm going, Jay, you're nuts. <laughs> I don't need 10 rolls of electrical tape. Well, um, well not that hard, cheap, cheap Harbor Freight stuff, you don't. <laughs> uh, actually, I bought I bought a roll. Look, this is make Jay happy. Um, and uh, uh, the funny part is, is I've used them all. <laughs> Oh yeah, and no, I, finally, I finally ordered. Um, I not only use those ten, but I've bought much more since then. I'm fixing everything with electrical tape, especially when you get hydro, hydro doing hydroponics. And uh, uh, so anyway, I finally got another ten pack of electrical tape. I'm so happy now because, um, especially since I've been working on my hydroponics, it's like, oh man, I need some tape. <laughs> Because you can wrap seams on pipes and stuff with it. It's great. So anyway, number one on the list. Add this to your list. If you're a prepper, add not just one roll, 10 or more, or even more than that. And of course, there's duct tape and all that stuff. But electrical tape is miracle tape, I'm telling you. So what's one of your favorites, Dale? Uh, I, I love that uh, Gorilla tape, the, the, yeah. the black stuff. Uh, I, I'm using that for some heavy duty stuff. I mean, it's not cheap or anything, but it's, I, you know, I got a roll in the toolbox of the pickup. I got a roll here in the house, got one out in the greenhouse and everything. I mean, you know, it's $16 a roll. It took me a few months to <laughs> get them in, but that's, uh, 
pretty handy. But no, the old electrical tape, that's a pretty good deal. I, I'm an old farm boy. I grew up back when you still had wire bales and yeah. everything and, and you know you hauled those loads of wire and when you were done feeding that stuff you folded it all up and you put it in a nice pile and you did everything you tied damn near every gate and everything else on the farm with that old bale of wire and i miss that stuff um yeah, i got tons of bale wire <laughs> yeah i i don't have any baling wire but back when i owned my construction business we installed uh irrigation systems on golf courses and sports fields and uh you know we had these rolls and rolls and rolls of the single strand 12 gauge wire i've still got a couple thousand feet down here in the shed so that stuff's everywhere around here i just take a take a cutter and cut a piece of it off and it, it, it's awesome everybody should have a roll yeah so i mean it's <laughs> such a simple little thing electrical tape bailing wire things like that um but uh man uh when you don't have it that's when you realize yeah. how much you use it and, uh, well, yeah, if it wasn't so. for electrical tape, I would have probably burned a bunch of different rigs up over the years doing all <laughs> kinds of jury ass wiring on them and everything, you know, putting stereos and CB radios and amplifiers and all this other stuff in them. And, you know, electrical tape, you didn't have the right connectors or anything. You just twist the wires together and put a whole bunch of electrical tape around it. You know, yep. keep them apart from each other. You're pretty good. <laughs> until until that stuff shorted out and started burning, then it just smells horrible. You know it for sure. <laughs> so yeah, that was I had to put that on my list. Let's go. You know, I keep. I mean, I finally. Um, you know, Sherry like she doesn't laugh at me when I do that, and we used to laugh at her dad, always telling us we should have so much of that tape. And now that I, I kind of have property and taking care of stuff. I, I keep a roll in like every jacket and uh, yeah, so it's, it's way up there in the list. So, but um, before we, um, and by the way, hi, uh, hello, Jack, um, but we thought uh, I thought I surprised you with a Monday show, um, but we are going to do a Thursday show also. <laughs> so, but, uh, um, and I think I told Jack I was in Facebook jail. So that was my reason and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, yeah, so, for those of you, uh, some of you guys, like I keep watching shows from people that are in the Carolinas and they're like complaining because it may be raining a few times here and there, but they're, they're getting temperatures where they're doing stuff and planting stuff. And it's like, I, and then last week we were kind of getting good weather. And so I was starting to plant stuff and all that stuff. And then, and I got some things even planted. And then what happens? <laughs> Like three days later, we're in winter conditions again. And it's like, it's it's just insane. I can't, I want to get things started, but I, and I'm doing winter, you know, uh, plants, but even they can only handle so much. So I'm over here in state of confusion, just going, oh heck. But I have heard this and I'm going to, I'd love to hear your opinion, Dale, is when you're planting early spring stuff that's before your frost date um it's okay to do and do it um but consider it 50 50 so maybe 50 percent of what your plant plant might take and if it doesn't you just got to have the attitude oh well and then a couple of weeks later try again so i don't know and i know well, you're yeah, planning I, a lot over there yeah, you know what I mean, and that you throw that fifty percent rule out here. So let's let's just call that fifty percent average across your entire crops, because you're going to lose a hundred percent of some of your crops that you put out. I guarantee you, you lose your tomatoes, your basil's, you know, any of your tender stuff like that. You're going to they're going to freeze. Every friggin' one of them is gone. You know, if they hit, we had a killing frost May 29th the last year, um, and everything. So I've kind of you know adapted my my planning schedules and everything else like that. Um, and, and there again, really the only thing you gain by trying to get ahead of, you know, I guess a normal growing season or something like that. You, the it, It's more about the light than it is the temperature. The plant wants a long photo period. The plant wants to keep growing and everything. And so up until that summer solstice, in June, these plants are going to want to keep going. Now, if you want to start extending that day length out and start getting it out in that 14, 15, 16 hours a day type of thing, you're going to get some production. My son's got some stuff coming on in his greenhouse over in the valley, 
where he had eight inches of snow last night. <laughs> over there. And here I haven't heard and I don't even think he's there. I think he's off shooting sage rats somewhere and his wife and kids are holding the fort down there and everything. Um, you know, and he started stuff early and he had some nice grow lights on it and the stuff's just completely blown out of its pots and everything else like that. You know, I think I related this story, you know, not too long ago. I tried back several years ago trying to get ahead of things on planting beans over in the valley and everything. And, and there again, okay, I went, I went to Oregon State University, Agricultural Engineering, Crop Science, one of the best crop databases online anywhere in the world. And I, I, you know, I'm just convinced I can do something that that university hasn't been able to do in the last 200 years. And that's somehow, you know, get my plants to grow ahead of time. And so I planted a crop of beans, of course, and then, you know, the, the once every 10 year hailstorm rose, rose through and just shatters the beans and some other stuff. And then what the bee, what the hail didn't get, the friggin' slugs finished off over the next couple of days and everything. You know, and so at that point in time, I just, you know, I, I, I'm i just going to go with what it says to plan. I'm not going to plan anything until the university recommendations and everything. This is how my buddies farm do and everything else. And they go, you get in a big hurry. Just just walk out in that field and pull your wallet out and start throwing $100 bills up in the air and walk away from them and everything. Because that's what it amounts to sometimes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so like I said, this year, uh, you know, we're growing a bunch of flats, flowers and vegetable starts and everything in our normal uh, uh, garden beds and everything. Mm -hmm. And that's going to have those tied up right up until the first or week of June easily and everything. And that's a good thing because otherwise I'd be planting them out there. And then I'd, I'd be out. I've got plastic over it now. In the past, I've just had to pour, pull plastic over it every night, which is a royal pain. And then when the wind comes up and everything else, and so it's just, and it's just better. We're going to do it this way. We'll wait till the stuff's gone. We'll pull the plastic all the way off and we'll plant it out the first week of June. And we should be fine. And I probably won't lose anything, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> Always do. <laughs> well, today I was planning on doing a spoiler alert. And uh, for those of you who have been watching our videos, you probably know by now we're trying to build some above ground garden boxes. So um, anyway, um, those videos might be a few weeks behind from reality. So I thought I'd let everybody see what our garden boxes came out to look like. So uh, these are nice. uh, four by eight by 27 inches high. And uh, uh, I'm not using four by fours in the corners. I'm actually using two by fours and, and, and L shaping them. Um, so uh, one is I didn't want to pay for four by fours. <laughs> yeah. and, and the L shape, by the way, allows me to keep the metal in the inside of the box. And so, Everything's protected as far as cutting your hands on the metal and all that stuff. So those are our, our garden boxes, and it took us, and as you watch our videos, you'll see it took a lot of fill dirt <laughs> to fill those. Yeah, you've got you, uh, one, two, three, rocks. four, five, six, seven, eight. You got 15 to 18 yards of material there easy. Yeah, so we... Uh, um, I, I don't know. Let me see if we can see the background of where we got the material. Um, so the rest of the field is towards us in this picture, and we were stripping off all the sod off of that field. And that's what we use for the first one-third of the boxes, maybe up to one-half has got sod in it. And, yeah. then, and then we put cardboard, and then we started changing to – compost and then later to filtered dirt to high quality bedding dirt and, uh, and then we added a uh, um worm castings and things like that so the tops are really um uh, got really good dirt and then it gets kind of uh, breaks down to compost and then it gets down to that sod which we hope the sod actually croaks <laughs> and and decomposes and doesn't oh, try to go through no, no, it will. It, it's done for down there. So, but yeah, so uh, you can kind of see, uh, if you see my cursor, the rest of the field, we still got to put, um, uh, we're putting fab 50 feet of fabric weave that direction. And that's where we're going to grow our things like squashes, anything that mm -hmm. lays on the ground. And then we'll have another 50 feet about in front of that. That'll be uh, pure dirt. We're going to rototill it and that's going to be corn. 
And we already got to that part because we still got two a month and a half for, um, before we can even plant corn. So, yeah. So that's that's the plan. We'll stick into it. <laughs> okay, it looks good. Yeah. So that's my little spoiler that um, those. So you guys want to watch our videos? You'll see us build our way to getting all eight of those in. That was quite an um, endeavor just to lay the, the fabric down. We for old people were on our knees all day doing staples and uh, no. it was like. That was a long couple. It took us three weeks to get that done. But we're really happy because I figured when we were in our 70s or 80s, <laughs> we could just take our little walkers out there and work on our garden beds that are above yes. ground that high. See, I did the same thing. I, I, I used four by fours and I extended them up above the bed quite a ways, actually. And I mean, that was, you know, because I was, didn't exactly know what kind of if I was going to put a cover over them or what I was going to do. Then I got to look at them and I go, well, this is pretty sweet. All I got to do is, you know, add some two by whatever's, you know, two by six, two by eights. Each one's here and I can drop about two of those on and I can add a foot and a half to it, which, you know, like you said, you know, you know, I don't like that bending over stuff and get down on the ground. No, I can't, I can't. Yeah. I, I used to be at the end of running my construction business. I was kind of doing all the mechanic work. Sometimes you had to get down on the floor in the shop and I had to make sure I had the hook close by for the electric overhead hoist and everything so I could clip it onto my belt and haul myself up with it. <laughs> Worked out pretty good, really. Yeah. I am, this is another just quick photo. Um, I, no, no, no. I, I'm finding that I can, I can get photos on if I use, photo, if I use photos from, um, from our phone that goes to Google and we can actually show you this stuff a little more in the podcast. So this is the, how we constructed these things. And uh, uh, for the center section, in, in order to move these, I just used my tractor, got this center beam, put a uh, chain around it. We carried them to each spot. They're actually yeah. fairly, they're still pretty light considering how big they right. are. And yeah. uh, they came out great. And uh, um, so, yeah, if, uh, if you guys are looking for a design for making something in your yard like this, uh, we figured... Until uh, lumber went up a little bit, I th still think you could get these done for a, about eighty to eighty-five dollars each, with the materials like that. So it's under a hundred bucks. So we're pretty happy with that. So that was kind of the goals because we we used to make our boxes out of two by twelves. Have you seen the price of a two by twelve? I, I, I can't even imagine what the, <laughs> it is. I, I I haven't even looked in that section of the store. I have no need for any of it right now. And so it's, well, I, you know, and it's just like, I have no need for any of it. So it's just, I, and I'm fortunate because I did build a fairly large deck, you know, off the back of the house. I did build the greenhouse. It is a stick built one. I did build Fort Knox chicken house that my wife has out here and everything. And I, we were able to do that to, you know, last year was the last of it before the lumber went up. Cause I, I can't imagine what it would be. I wouldn't pay it. Like, I'd figure something else out. I'd love to build another greenhouse, but my next greenhouse, I would build exactly the same, but I'd insulate it two layers. One, it would be built by two by fours, and I'd do my regular outside plastic, but I want to put an inner plastic wall between it so it's actually insulated. And I want to try to make it my own, build my own um, uh, environmentally controlled greenhouse, and I don't want to use a kit. <laughs> but I don't want to pay for the wood either. <laughs> well, you know, we, we used to build them that way, double layer plastic like that uh, and everything. And then we'd put a little, uh, you know, dryer heater motor type of a thing, 110 in there and inflate that layer in between there. But over the last year or so, and I mean, I'm using the same probably off the shelf plastics that you are and everything else. And I, I'm just not convinced that these rolled plastics um or, or or the way to go here in the in the high desert where we live with that you know at the 2800 foot elevation with the uv rays and everything else i mean one year pretty much smoked the plastic on my greenhouse and which i expected it to and so then you want to look at an alternative source like a polycarbonate or a lexan or something like that and then the cost just absolutely goes through the roof and this little 12 by 12 greenhouse of mine to put polycarbonate Lexan just off the shelf, off the wall down at Home Depot would, would be $900 and everything. It's like, 
you know, so I guess I'll just keep putting layers of plastic on it every Yeah, other, we're using we bought our we bought our plastic from a greenhouse company and we it's got a fifty percent reduction in it of yeah. sunlight through it. And it's um, very, I can't remember how many millimeters it is. It's a pretty heavy plastic. Probably and, a six uh, so millimeter. Our first, our first year is doing great. So Yeah, most of the, those greenhouse plastics are out there. We used to buy them a lot for our coal frames and a, and a couple of the heated greenhouses we had at our farm over in the valley and everything. And they're expensive, but over their valley, you know, over there, they'd call it a four-year a four year poly. And I could get a good six years out of it over there. I don't. I probably couldn't get two years out of it over here and everything. I probably, I'm going to try throwing some shade cloth up on top of it this year, maybe cut some of it UV rate down and everything. But otherwise that stuff's just brittle. It's gone. You know, and so you're look, wow. looking at this thing. Cause my whole, my whole little thing with my seedlings and my idea of selling some stuff and everything else is being challenged by the central Oregon weather and climate. And, you know, this is going to determine if this is a viable thing for next year, you know, or if I just get my money back out of the <laughs> dish here and see, I'm because about, just, are, you're going to go, you're going to the market are you, uh, at the beginning of I, next month, right? Yeah, I think the next month. I mean, they have one that's coming Saturday and everything else, but I've got nothing ready to go as far as, you know, plants or anything like that. And, and really somebody buy them. I mean, oh, what a nice plant. I can be, be, be protected from frost. They're going to leave it out. It's going to die, you know, type <laughs> of thing. Gets guaranteed, so, you know. So, what so I don't want I don't want to ranch market charge for having a table there for them. Oh, I think it's it's just it, it is a horrible, outrageous sum of five dollars. It is just outrageous that it costs <gasps> that much to bring your stuff say, there. So I was going to do some jet stars for you, uh, tomatoes. Um, yeah. The take, and I thought maybe I'll do twenty jet stars, and I'll just give them to you, and you can sell them for like two, three bucks, and I'll just take half, yeah, whatever, and, and to see if they because jet stars are awesome tomatoes, and I can pop them out like babies. <laughs> well, that's you, you, you can start them so much faster than I can. I mean, I learned a lot of my tomatoes. I started probably a week early. I think even you know delaying from it there. And I had them too damn cold. I, they got to have some bottom heat on them or I'm going to have to get, you know, crank them buddies on them because tomatoes don't like to be cold. And when they're cold, they just don't grow and yeah. everything. And, and so, you know, I finally got mine to where they are. And, you know, I've got to I got to get them transplanted up and, and all that. But I'm just not going to have enough ready. So, I, yeah, I'm thinking first first market they have, yeah, which so is I, first and third Saturdays in May. I thought I'd just come over. Keep you company. I was going to yeah. split the cost over the on the table, but it's like apparently I was not going to set you back too bad. <laughs> yeah, no, it's you know, and I sell, <laughs> sell two of my two of my tomatoes. I'll <laughs> cover my half. <laughs> yeah, I just thought that thing. I mean, I used to, you know, the Beaver and Farmers Market when that thing first started out years ago. I was out in Forest Grove, there, you know, and so it was, you know, now you wouldn't drive that far, you know, for anything. But I mean, back in those days, it was fairly common you know and it, my wife and i had, you know just kind of blended our two families and everything and you know the economy was eh, okay and but anyway i could always grow something and i would grow flowers and, and vegetable starts and all this other stuff we were doing in the nursery you take it in the beer to farmer's market and when they first started that i was one of the original vendors and i think i hung in there for about four years every saturday from like may through september or something it, we were making eight nine hundred dollars cash a day selling plant material in there at the Beaverton Farmers Market, you know, and that uh -huh. it, it, that was probably the height of it. And then it kind of started tapering off as more people came to the market. You got less of their available money and everything else. And I think the last time I went to it, I was down about two seventy a day or something like that. Yeah. But it was it was amazing the amount of money people spent there. But I don't I don't know maybe times have changed maybe people you know hopefully i'm hoping people will want to grow stuff this year because yeah, it's going to be expensive sure. or hard to source yeah i think somehow between what maybe i can grow and you can grow and we just put them all on the same table will look really full yeah i have st I actually have been doing studies about how they sell at a at the markets and they say 
Load your table up. Load it up. Even if, uh, Load your table up, and you better have some color up there. People look at green stuff. They don't want to see green shit. They want to see color. They want to see something pretty, something that makes right. them feel good, and yep. they will buy it. And, and that, that's my absolute scientific observation after years and years of doing those things. Well, one and, of the things they say in the market is don't go around bragging like, oh, I sold all my stuff. That, and then that's stupid. That means that if you sold out early, then how many sales you didn't get all day because you sold out early? Or you're selling too cheap. <laughs> you know. And I mean, that's why? the thing. I yeah, I'm I never I never sold out when I went to those markets. I always had stuff back in the pickup and everything like that, you know. And I'm the same way here. I mean, if if we will take X amount of stuff down there of the different flowers and the starts and everything else and you know, I guess if we run out, it's, you know, it's all, you know, maybe a mile and a half at the most from there to my house. And obviously I'll be the designated runner on that type of stuff. And yeah, you don't want to do that. You want people to, you know, having an, having an empty booth, is just, that's don't do you any good. You know, you can always make it look full. <laughs> that's, that's the plan. So I wanted to, um, let's see here show people what we've been doing this week, which they'll come out in our videos later. But uh, what I want to do is switch uh, the subject for a short time to hydroponics. And uh, I think I can use this video. Let's see. Okay, so what I want to show you first is what we call our hydroponics NFTs. So... Um, uh, remember how to do this. So <laughs> what we've fired up so far. So what we're working on is getting all of our systems going again. Uh, the corn is hydroponics, but we're not talking about the corn part you're seeing there. Um, but the center section, it's got the little, uh, let me change to a, a single picture. That's not moving. Um, so we have these pipes right here. Um, they're called NFTs. So we finally clean those out because they get over the summer, you get a lot, because we use uh, salt. Um, you get a lot of minerals on your pipe. So we had to scrub all that stuff down, clean the tanks out and stuff, get the pumps going again. And, and both of my NFTs, I have two of them. I have this short one that has a trellis system on it. And that's what you're seeing here. And then there's another one. Um, Let's see if I, well, this picture will kind of show you as far as video wise. Um, let's see if I can get it to hold. This is the taller one. Now this NFT right here, that one's up and running now too. And we actually installed, um, and you can see how long it is. It's a, it's a three, three 10 foot poles uh, attached to each other. And it's, so that's 30 feet or more in pipe. And we have little two inch holes in the top. And all these are is little rivers. And we call them NFTs, which means nutrient film technique. And all it is is you're pumping nutrients to the front of your uh, pipes. And it's 30, uh, about a 3% uh, decline to the tank at the back. And the water is just running like a little river 24 7. And in the, the space between the fish and the top of the plant, is how they get their oxygen. So anyway, so we finally got it running. So our excitement is, is we, we actually loaded it with some uh, uh, spinach and they're surviving uh, okay. even with these cold temperatures. So the front of the tall one here, you see that's at, at waist level and has the little tarp on top. Um, it's running, we got it cleaned. We're really happy. So we're, we're finally getting our hydroponics up and running. Uh, the second two hydroponics that we have going um, is our floating wraps. Nice. And so these are hydroponics, which are that styrofoam you see, and that's a tank. It's about six inches deep. And we put about 40 gallons of water in there, and we put our nutrients in there. And we have aerators in there, like a like a, a aquarium. And that's kind of what keeps everything aerated. And that's how the plants get their oxygen uh, is from the aerators. And so we got air stones in there and they're blowing. I got like four air stones in each tank here. 
And uh, as you can see, <laughs> uh, floating rafts and lettuce get along really well. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, we have so much, we get so much lettuce. And so almost anything I put in there lettuce wise has gone nuts. Um, also hydroponic uh, rafts are really good for spinach. I've done uh, Swiss chard. I've done, I've started my, if you look off to the right, I think that's broccoli. You see, those are starters. And, uh, and then I'll take them to a certain level and then I'll put them into something different, either put them into soil or put them into Dutch buckets, which is not in this picture, but in the background is this is surrounded by Dutch buckets. So this system has got running turned on today. So we've cleaned these tanks. We got the aerators all cleaned up. I added the nutrients. I put a heater, like with your recommendation, um, I put a heater in there. So I'm taking this water that's in these tanks up to 65 degrees. And, uh, yep. and I've got five new Brand new, first time lettuces in there to see if they take it all. And so that, that's our uh, next one. What I wanted to show you, if I got one handy, is the pitch. There we go. Yeah, that'll work. So this is the greenhouse looking at it from a camera we have up above. And uh, those are Dutch buckets you see along the edges. Um and those are now up and running as of today too. <laughs> is that so is that Sherry today? I, is that today's picture there? No. <laughs> oh, I was going to say them plants don't look horribly happy right there on the left. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually uh, our tomatoes from last year. Okay. Those are actually almost all jet stars. Nice. And uh, uh, little transplant shot going on there. <laughs> yeah. So uh, once I've got. Uh, yeah, this is when we we're actually building it. But uh, as you can see, I wanted to show you is our uh, the Dutch buckets are the ones that we're mostly excited about. They are you can tell that we did really well on Jet Stars, and uh, Jet Stars are a really sweet tomato. Not the best for making some sauces because they're actually too sweet. But talk about the perfect sandwich kind of tomato. Yeah. Um, and we did make we did make sauces and everything out of that stuff, but um, all this stuff was grown on Dutch buckets. And uh, I was yeah, you could it. put three more rows of those in that greenhouse, there, Bob. <laughs> well, it's not that easy. <laughs> you know, I I know, but that's that's the production farmer coming out in. Be there. There's, well, there's open there's open space. We don't make no money on that brown or black ground. <laughs> I know, and I got the same. Concern. I was going to show you. I, try, I thought I had another Dutch bucket picture in here. Um, when they were filled up. Oh, and then this is the other hydroponics we do is the growing towers, and these are our strawberry towers. We have not fired this up yet. We have put new soil in it. We've cleaned them up, but all the t all the strawberries we put in last year did not make it through the year, so I got to reload it. But these things went nuts with strawberries and uh, uh so the, um so this is kind of my hydroponic review but i wish i could have had more pictures of i thought i had some hang in here guys should have been more organized right oh uh, we should all be more organized yeah i was just trying to show well let's kind of oh, show you, you. yeah so this is the uh, Dutch buckets. Let's, I'm waiting for the video to load. Come on, go, 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 go. Those are those jet stars. Those are jet stars. They're That's about. Nice they're a bigger tomato, but they're not like they're not like the big beefs or anything. And uh, yeah, see, that's I went all in on beef masters and beef steaks this year. That's the only varieties I've got. So hopefully, they'll size themselves accordingly. Yeah. But you see the Dutch but Dutch buckets below. You can see we're just tons of tomatoes. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I just thought I had more broad pictures of the of the. Uh, yeah, I just thought I had more of the Dutch buckets. So anyway, our, our excitement is the fact that we actually got almost all of our hydroponics, and uh, and 
last year at this time, we were still building the greenhouse. So we're way ahead of schedule from last year. So the problem yeah. is, is when can I get that first tomato into the Dutch buckets without it being too cold? And so we got ours in last year. It was definitely June, but I want to so bad to try to get um, tomatoes started in there in late May and gain me another week or two. And that's our biggest goal. And uh, so, yeah, that's the, that's, kind of our big excitement going on in our homestead is getting the hydroponics up and running. Um, but at the same time, we're building those conventional gardens too. So I'm not just totally, totally a hydroponics person. I, I do like conventional gardening. And so, uh, um, so I want to kind of show you guys as like, we practice what we preach here. We're learning new ways to grow food. We're finding uh, different ways, you know, different techniques, things to make it easier. And one thing I, I want to put forward to everybody if you're like older in our age like ages like me and dale is the problem that happened on this homestead was sherry's parents um had this place and they're really into gardening flowers well after they got into their 80s they couldn't maintain this place and so a lot of things got grown over it was a way too much for them to handle so lesson learned since uh one of the things we love, the fact that we bought it. And so we have all these gardens that we can, uh, Sherry's mom is still around, but she's in a assisted living. We can still bring her over and take her through the gardens and all that stuff. And she loves it. And so uh, the difference is she doesn't have to do the work because she can hardly walk. <laughs> um, but they couldn't keep up enough uh, weeding and they couldn't, um, things were hard to stoop, but they were gotten into her 80s. Um, it took Sherry and I almost a half a year just to cut back everything so we could get control of this property again. So the lesson learned is we're trying to think of things that will make it easier for us to still grow things as we age. And so we want things that are more where we don't have to stoop as much. We can do it now, but 10 years from now <laughs> might be a yeah. little hard. So I, I think the point I want to put across is, is gardening's, we want everybody to garden. We want everybody to be self-sufficient. And yes, it gets harder as you get older, but build your tools, build your growing um, um, materials and, and all that stuff where you don't, you know you're going to get older later so you can maintain them without, you know, I mean, if I can still get around with a walker, I can handle those above ground gardens easy. And some of my hydroponics are almost, all of them are almost chest, um, waist high. So a lot of that I can maintain pretty good when I get older. So uh, um, uh, but low garden beds and stuff like that, that gets a little harder. <laughs> and so keep that in mind if you're getting older and you're trying to do gardening um, to keep your age and your abilities in mind um, as you age, because it's a reality. I hate to talk about it and I hate to think about it, but um, and then when it gets too hard, you sell it all and let the kids do it. <laughs> There you go, right there. You know, it has to be age appropriate and everything. And I've went through several phases in my life. I had a nice property over in the valley, nursery, you know, a small farm and everything. And, land, and I had a landscape company and everything. And so we were doing landscape jobs and I'd keep an extra plant here or two and everything. And I'd put those out on the property and I just, you know, I landscaped it up pretty nice. That was okay. It was a decent company. I had people to take care of my own yard. I didn't do as much of it as I did in those days. And then circumstances changed and I don't have these crews of people around to take care of this anymore. And this thing became a problem. It became this hydra headed monster that required every free minute I had and everything else. And so a wife and I talked about it, ordered up an excavator and I went out there and I ripped about 80% of this stuff out. I went wall to wall grass basically. Um, which was good. I had a bunch of kids that actually didn't know that mowing grass was work if they could drive the riding lawnmower around for a while. It took them a few years to figure that out and everything. <laughs> and so then we mowed grass and everything else like that. So you have to stay, you know, age appropriate. And, and in our as we built our place out here at Crooked River Ranch and everything, we've done just that. We've recognized our limitations, know what we're capable of doing. I reduced my yard down even more this year. I decided I needed another gravel path around it instead of mowing, you know, some some more grass and everything. And so changed that out, changed a couple other things out. 
We have the beds. We have the stuff that's in the ground in the backyard. Doesn't require too much. Everything out in the front, obviously, is somewhat deer proof. Everything is drip irrigated on a time clock. Um, I can walk away from this place, you know, for a couple of weeks during the season pretty easily. Everything a water. I have Wi-Fi contact with my sprinkler controller and everything uh, along that line. Uh, and it, so we can. We can go do some things and everything else. But knowing what you can do, um, you know, I'm looking at everything. And I, I mean, I'm to the point we found a nice impeditum early bloom and rhododendron down at Home Depot the other day. And I looked at the thing, it was decent price, you know, 22 bucks or something like that. And I go, that's, that's a hell of a big hole I got to dig for that thing. You know, and that's how, that's how my brain works as I get old. Like that thing's too damn big. I am not going to dig that big a hole. And we ended up buying it. We'll, you know, get the grandkid son to dig it or something like yeah. that. It'll cost me a few extra bucks and everything, but at least I like, I, I, that's I how I look at everything. It was a rhododendron, right? Yeah, it was uh, like the PJM, the, the real yeah. dark, early blooming rhododendron. It had I a couple those. little, oh, it, it had a couple of blooms <laughs> on it. I had it in a greenhouse for about two or three days, and Diane says, "Let's just bring that thing in the house for a while." You know, it's kind of pretty and everything. So she's got it in the house in the sun here, and everything. That's but yeah, cool. no, you have to know how to do that. I've got enough grass um, here that the dog, the grand dogs can still play on and everything. That grass could go away very easily in the next year or so. I, <laughs> I'm not attached to it anymore. Grass, turf made me a lot of money in my career and everything else. And I enjoy it. I like the looks of it. I like the smell of it and everything else. But I'm not going to bust my ass until I'm 90 mowing grass. Or so. That is not going to happen. Well, you know, I can turn it all into part food. Of the, well, that's part <laughs> of a problem on this property is Jay had – one, two, three, four big paddocks, which are big areas of just grass. Well, you can see what we're doing with one of them. We're putting those planter boxes in and turning it into uh, conventional gardens because it takes, with a riding lawnmower, three and a half hours to mow all mm -hmm. of our lawns every week. And you know, <laughs> and, 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 and you know, you know what, what the primary chemical composition of grass is, Rob? It's ninety five percent. It's ninety five percent water, and five percent cellular structure. So you know, and we used to see this a lot over in the valley. Everybody goes out and they mow their grass. They take the clippings, they dump them in a barrel, they dump them in the back of the pickup, and you guys are hauling a bunch of water around. That's what you're doing. And <laughs> and in, in fact, when you fertilize your grass, um, the first three mowings after. You fertilize. If you collect the clippings and remove them, you have removed 50% of the applied nitrogen that you just put on. So you just took fertilizer off of your, your ground. And many, you know, probably 18 years ago when we still had our landscape business, and I had an extensive history uh, in the equipment business with recycler mowing technology and everything. And that came on. And I says, we're buying a recycler more. Anybody that wants our services, we will recycle their grass. It won't look any different. I'm not going to haul another blade of grass around. It's the most ridiculous thing in the world. And yeah. and from that point on, and we never have, you know, since that day. Um, you know, yeah, obviously, we that's we, all we do is we, we mulch all of our grass. We don't keep. Yeah. It's like. Uh, and and it just works great. <laughs> I mean, you, you know, you go out there and you cut it. It piles up on there. You know, kick it around, hit it with a blower or something like that. In three hours over here, it's going to be gone. You're never even going to see it or anything <laughs> like that. The neighbors. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, people use, these guys used to mow this, these custom mowers and everything. They'd go around, they'd mow these people's grass, and they got grass piled up above the cab of the pickup, and they'd haul it down to the recycle center, have to shovel it out of there and pay 20 bucks it, to get rid of it and everything. It just made no sense at all. And it's mm -hmm. it's taken people a long time to figure that out. but. Yeah, you know, it's still. I was going to. I was going to ask you about what are some of the favorite fertilizers you're using in your um, above ground uh, gardens and stuff. Well, in my above ground gardens, and there's a lot of this, you know, content out there. You're going to find different uh, types of things. Um, and there again, me being an old turf guy and everything, I had to keep turf grass looking green most of the time to keep my clients happy and everything like that. So, uh, you know, my horticultural background came up with a, a fertilizer mix and it's fairly common out there now. Um, and we'll just focus on the nitrogen portion of it. Nitrogen comes 
in two different forms. It comes in anatomical nitrogen, which is soluble nitrogen, and it comes in slow release nitrogen, which is different formulations that are either released by hydrolysis or temperature or something else like that. So if you take a straight 16, 16, 16, say Viral Common Garden fertilizer equal analysis across there, that's, a, that's an all soluble. It's a one application type of thing. If you're going to apply it, apply it pre-plant and mix it in like that. And that'll help those salts you were talking about, your Dutch buckets and everything from building up in, in your native soils like that. So work it in like that. Being an old turf guy, I thought, you know, the 20, and it, I think the analysis is somewhere between 21 and 27. Anyway, it's a 21, 7, 15, 5. It's a turf fertilizer with 50% slow release. Um, I like the anatomical nitrogen portion of it is just about what a triple 16 would be. And then the rest of that is, is going to be a slow release. So it's going to give you an initial release. It's going to flush some, some nitrogen out there and kick things going. And then as the season moves, you move across the seasons, um, you know, you got some additional nitrogen in there and everything that's going to keep releasing with hydrolysis. You're going to have a lot of bacterial um, decomposition going on in your new beds uh, from all that material put in there and you get some bacterial action going. So you, you could see an increase in nitrogen requirements there. So I, I like my turf fertilizer. I put that on, <coughs> excuse me, at that, you know, that 20, whatever rate, it, 400 pounds of the acre thereabouts. You can calculate that down to square footage or handfuls or however you, you want to do it. But that's what I like. And then uh, in my greenhouse crops and also in my, my above ground beds out here, then I do go in about every three days with a soluble uh, nitrogen fertilizer, a hose in sprayer like that. Um, you combine that, and of course, I inoculated uh, the native soils with bacteria and some mycorrhizal material uh, before I covered them up with the, the ground cloth. And so that's been sitting in there. It'll kind of activate when we get some water going in there and everything, and that'll kind of get the whole soil web thing going. And that's kind of the fertilizer program that I've went with. Um, you know, that's the, the granular fertilizer. You know, sometimes I'll go in with a second application because we do water and fairly heavily, uh, even though it's a micro irrigation type of a thing, you will flush it out and <clears throat> your, uh, your above ground containers that you've got like that, it'll take them a while to what I call stabilize, you know, find their level of bacterial decomposition that's going on in mm -hmm. there. So, you know, you could be looking at some increased rates there, but, uh, you know, just keep it simple. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, since I've been, uh, you and I have been talking and stuff, I have uh, not only bought and, but applied in my new beds, uh, the 161616. 16. I've never used it before. And of course, I've added some other things. I've put the bone meal in all of them too. On each that's, that's another and also, good one. I, I, I like the bio, bone meal. The bio um, micro um, edition, I've done that too. Yep. And then I actually added something I've never used before is a blood meal. Yeah. Um, so I bought some of that and then uh, uh, using that just a little bit. Um, uh, and let's see, what was the last thing I put? Oh, and of course, um, uh, everything I plant, I put a little handful of, uh, I normally would, I can't find very much of it, but um, worm castings, I found just a little bag, a little bag. And that's all I've been able to find so far. So anyway, so everything I plant, I just put a little handful of worm castings in each hole. <laughs> Normally, I put it in the whole bed, but uh, anyway, that so helps, yeah, that helps start the bacteria process going. You know, anytime you add the, that material in there, that bone meal is an excellent. It's a fairly, you know, low nitrogen source, three something, but it's got some nice soil structure to it. It really, it really adds something to the soil structure, the mineral component that a lot of people are lacking in, you know, understanding that 5% of your soil profiles in your beds are, is, you know, organic matter, which is in a constant state of decomposition. So it's really more about soil structure and, and what you've used to build that soil than it is actual organic matter. Yeah. Well, yeah, because uh, I'm not going to have any trouble with organic matter being in the soil. <laughs> For sure, but I know there's a lot of other things I needed in there, so that's what I put in all those 
all six, eight beds got all those things I told you about. And uh, so, yeah, it sounds like we're kind of in the same page. So, yeah. Yeah. Cool. It's all uh, about this has nothing world. to do with hydroponics. Hydroponics is a different game. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Um, and let's uh, see. Well, I actually have a, quite a list of things that I was going to talk about today. Um, let's switch over to prepping a little bit because we've been pretty much gardening the whole time. Um, this week, have you done anything or noticed anything unique about buying food? Um, went to town, just topped off on some stuff today. Didn't, you know, supplies look pretty good and everything. Um, prices, you know, I, I, I don't do a lot of the actual cash register transactions on, on, the, on the food. Diane does a lot of that um, and everything. Obviously, you know, we're kind of fuel prices. We're kind of in a hold on right now. Uh, in food prices, I, I, I think we're going to head into a summer honeymoon, I think, for a period of time here uh, as far as food shortages and everything else goes. Um, it, it's going to be a relatively calm 90 days, I think. Uh, and then I think you're going to see things start to change. You know, prep-wise, I've learned quite a bit this week about propane and using propane for heat as I've got it going out here in my seedling greenhouse you know, right now. And so it's kind of given me a new appreciation for how much propane I would need to heat my house or domicile or whatever. Uh, and so I've looked at that. I've kind of, I added another larger propane canister and I did add another big buddy heater um, to my prep. So spent a little bit of money on that stuff. And it's necessary for what we're trying to do here in the greenhouses, but it's also nice to have like that. Price-wise, uh, propane's three forty nine dollars down at our little store down there he's got a price war going with the the rv park around the corner who's at 255 but they're never there to fill your tank so <laughs> I don't know how that's working out um so yeah prep wise food wise really i, I i'm pretty impressed with the quantities and everything else that i've seen in the store i haven't seen anything i mean i in what kind of a time frame could we put on this some of those shortages and stuff we were seeing you know, it was up to a month, two months ago, you know, so we've kind of had a little reprieve here. And I think yeah. that's kind of going to go on this, but this honeymoon is going to end sometime. Uh, and I, I think, think so we're going to all, I think we're all going to be in a little bit, you know, different situation as far as sourcing our, our proteins and everything else like that. So <clears throat> once again, you know, you heard it from me a thousand times, just keep the hammer down, just keep buying stuff, yeah. just keep stocking up. Yeah. Like uh, Sherry and I, one of the things we finally bought a Dutch oven. Um, we wanted a deep dish dish iron. Uh, we're starting to really enjoy cooking on iron skillets and stuff. So right. we didn't have a deep deep dish one. So we finally got a ceramic iron Dutch bucket, yeah. um, which we're actually going to use for the first time tonight. Um, but we're kind of like making sure we got the kind of cooking tools we want. So we've been spending a lot of money on little things like that. Plus we're getting ready for uh, prepping. Uh, uh, our biggest concern is like, I don't think we have enough backup milk for making, you know, cooking with or cereals or anything like that. So we're now buying gallon jugs of milk and which we can do a gallon per load on our freeze dryer. So uh -huh. uh, starting tonight, we're actually starting out uh, freeze drying a gallon of milk and continue to do that and build up our numbers. We've got some already freeze dried, but we just felt like we're kind of weak in milk. And uh, uh, but now we're starting like you can't really freeze dry when your garage is at freezing temperatures. It actually yeah. warns you not to run the freeze dryer. So we haven't ran it that much in the last two or three months. Um, but now it's like, all right, it's, it's good enough that we can start running it. So uh, anyway, so we're really going to be piling on our dried, you know, freeze dried stuff because um, we just think that's such a good investment. Because, <laughs> um, and what I'm really curious about is you and I probably you probably go to the same place, but there's a place called Ryan's Produce in Redwood, yeah. which is yeah. I'm curious to see what his prices and stuff are going to be like, and his supplies are going to be like this year. Um, but I, I think he's probably, he seems to do pretty well. I mean, I, that's not a lot of locally grown stuff. That stuff is brought in from out of the area, but he does, you know, obviously have some kind of an import distribution mechanism going on there. And those are the kind of places people got to look for is these independent small produce. He's specially produce. That's all it is. Get in there and get your produce. If you're going to do preserving 
freeze drawing or whatever you're going to do, that's the place you're going to be buying this stuff at. Um, you know, there may be a farm around here. I highly doubt it because growing this stuff is hard in the high desert on those kind of scales and everything. Yep. And so, you know, you go in there and you buy enough stuff and, and whatever method of preservation you select, uh, you know, you're going to you're going to do OK. Uh, and that's that's how I think a lot of people are going to achieve some level of independence and preparedness. Well, that's our plan of attack is like, uh, obviously, we're not going to be able to grow all the little things. We have been like focusing on more of the smaller items, making sure we have plenty of vanilla, uh, things to cook with, baking uh, soda, baking powders. Um, we're, we're building up our stocks in that. Like every time we go to Buy Mart, we buy a little more of those kind of things. Um, yep. And uh, so, yeah, that's kind of been our focus of the last month has been um, all the little loose ends, the little things, um, and then getting ready to start doing much more freeze drying out. I mean, we got the machine; we should be using it. So, uh, um, is and um, yeah, and then we're also kind of uh, Sherry's learning how to do more breads and stuff like that. So she's actually working on one in the <laughs> this house is going to be smelling really good real soon. She's <laughs> making a handmade bread that can be nice. put in the refrigerator and used for several things and learned it from Melissa, something she's a homesteader up in Washington. And uh, so we're, uh, we're doing that tonight, but so we get these like little loose ends we're taking care of. Um, I think with all this stuff going on, we're just realizing the loose ends are the ones that are going to kind of burn us. Like, you know, just the little things, uh, certain little tools or certain little herbs yeah. and stuff, which I was going to ask you if you're growing any herbs, but we're running out of time. Um, so I'll, I'll keep this list a lot for Thursday's show. We will be having a, th a show on Thursday, guys. So um, um, I am growing some herbs, some basil, um, okay. some cilantro. Uh, the basil I'll dry myself uh, and and just package it up that way, and either you know sell it or use it for trading material or give it away or something like that. And the cilantro's, um, you know, just that. Some of those other herbs are perennials. And I, I don't know. I, I'll just buy a regular plant, plant them outside, and see what happens. I, I, yeah. I, um, I, I, I I'm getting more. Was gonna, last little report I was going to say for our homestead is we also have, I think I've mentioned it in other shows, we do have more chickens on the way. Um, they'll be here on May second, and um, the difference is we're adding two roosters to our Rhode Island Reds, so now we can be. Um, sustainable we can actually if we want to make more chickens we can um so not only could we have lots of laying eggs but we could actually eat our chickens and actually yeah. reproduce them and so we never we've always bought hens and that's all we've ever had here well it's like that's kind of dumb <laughs> so so yeah so i'm kind of exci excited uh, we haven't had roosters here for two years so uh, I think nice I took a picture and I'll send it over to you, Rob, of a chicken tractor operation over at Rain Shadow Organics on Holmes Road. I took it okay. today. They, they they must have about 250 chickens out there. It's amazing. It's a cool <laughs> thing. Yeah, I actually got a chicken tractor out here when I used it. And it's amazing. I need to take pictures, but where we moved, to, we, we used it for a short period of time. And I've got these green spots, of, of yeah. rectangular spots throughout my yard, wherever I put those chickens. And I was only a couple go. of weeks. It was amazing. That's so anyway, guys, we're going to wrap this show up. We're at the end here. And I want to thank everybody for watching. And uh, and um, I know Thanks, it was a Jack. Monday. You guys used to Thursdays. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we appreciate it. And, uh, um, yeah, thank you, Jack. And uh, so, yeah, um, Thursday we'll be back on. We uh, got lots to talk about, so many things going on. And I'm busier than heck, so I don't know about yeah. you, but. I'm definitely yeah. feeling feeling summer coming. So anyway, guys, thanks for watching. Take care, and we'll see you next time. Bye. See y'all. Thanks. Thank you very much for watching our video. Please take the time to like, subscribe, and share our videos all over the whole wide world. Thanks.